I just let me know if you can't hear my voice or whatever if I start talking more quietly. And um, if you have any questions for me um, throughout my talk, feel free to raise your hand and interject anytime. Um, I, I'm, this is not like a prepared speech, so you won't disrupt my flow or anything. So, so yeah, just feel free to ask any questions. And um, thank you very much for going today. Uh, my name is Brian Rodman. I was born in Oakland, California. Um, my parents lived in the Bay Area um, in Alameda. My father was kind of like a bond trader and a stockbroker. He worked for uh, Merrill Lynch, Charles Schwab, and I worked for Scott Trade. And then my mother, um, she worked in real estate um, until she became uh, a stay-at-home mother. I have uh, one, I'm the oldest in my family. I was born January 3rd, 1988. I have one sister who's two years no younger. Her name is Rebecca. She's in Colorado. And then I have a little brother who's seven years younger. His name is Brendan, and he uh, he's currently attending the University of Colorado right now. Um, so my my mom it really is a is a bit of a worry wart. She hates earthquakes. So every time there was an earthquake in the Bay Area, she would panic. And then eventually, my dad decided, all right, let's go back to Colorado because that's where they both grew up. So we moved to um, Littleton, Colorado, just on the very southern edge of Denver. Um, we were right the neighborhood farthest south. The, the neighborhood just across the street from us is Highlands Ranch. Used to be a dirt road when we moved in. And I, I grew up there. I went to Highland Elementary School, and or Highland Elementary School, Powell Middle School, and then Arapahoe High School. And um, I kind of was always uh, interested in, in the military as a kid. My, my grandfather, he was in, uh, he was in the Air Force. Um, when he was a young person, and, and then my other grandpa, he was uh, he was in the army, he was in the military police. So I kind of like talked to them and found out about their military experience, and I thought it was pretty interesting. And what really um, sealed the deal for me was on September 11th, I just like decided I have to join, and I was 13 at the time. So from then on, it was kind of always in the back of my mind that I wanted to do um, something. So uh, why the army? I get uh, extremely motion sick. So the Air Force and the Navy were out of the question. I, I would, I would have just been a liability to everyone involved. So I kind of like just uh, decided to join the Army because you can't really get motion sick running around in the woods. Um, so after um, I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Colorado, Boulder, right up the street, and I did uh, the ROTC program for four years, and that was just. Um, training over the four, four years of college to learn how to become um, a second lieutenant, how to become an officer. And just during that time, we spent most of our time training um, uh, small unit tactics, so like squad and platoon level. And we would actually like, we'd, we'd go down to the Air Force Academy and do some training there. Um, I think it was three times a semester, we'd go out to, to the field and we went to the Air Force Academy a lot. We went to um, Camp Guernsey. Um, up in Wyoming and did some training there. Um, and then, um, in, I, so I went to CU from 2006 to 2010. Um, I decided to study, I started as aerospace engineering and then I switched to mechanical engineering and then I switched to biomedical engineering. I just was really indecisive and couldn't make up my mind. Um, and then in May, uh, I graduated somehow in four years and um, I commissioned as a second lieutenant and um, that was cool. My, my mother and my father pinned me up at the, up at the Boulder campus. That's where I commissioned. And then, um, uh, three, so three weeks after I graduated on that, I went on temporary duty to Fort Lewis, Washington. I was uh, opposition forces for uh, uh, an officer training camp. So I kind of just hung out in the woods for 14 hours a day and um, played dead when the, the, the blue force shot me. So that was fun. And then after that, um, in 2010, I went to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, which is where uh, the engineer school is. Um, Fort Leonard Wood is in the middle of Missouri. It's kind of between, uh, it's two and a half hours southwest of St. Louis. Sometimes it's called Fort Lost in the Woods because there's just trees everywhere and all the, all the towns nearby are, are really small and everything. And the, the military police army school is there and then so is the, the, the chemical school. So those are the three schools that are there. Um, so one, I, one thing about the, the engineer branch is that um, I guess uh, the, for the officers at least, there was a huge backup at the engineer school. 
So my, uh, my course, my, my officer training course, I had to wait three months for it to begin because there was a huge backup. So what they call that, for some reason they call it, you were snowboarding. So they assigned me to a, a temporary position. They, they made me the uh, executive officer of a basic training company. So this is before I had any official army training. I was the executive officer of a basic training company. So imagine a butter bar with no military experience trying to convince drill sergeants to go to mandatory training. It did not work out too, too well. But other, yeah, I mean, it was basically yeah, a sheep trying to tell wolves what to do. So yeah, but that was, that was a good experience working with the, the drill sergeants. And they actually um, helped me out a lot and did a lot of things to kind of develop me as a leader. And yeah, I, I was actually really glad I did that. And I kind of learned about um, how to how to manage uh, ranges, how to manage land, and how to do all the logistics for ranges, like the, the chow and the ammunition and the transportation, everything like that. And then I went to my um, officer um, training. It was, there were 60 people in our class. Um, at, it was at the engineer school. And it was about, I want to say about 2 thirds classroom, so just basically reading doctrine. As you can see, we don't read doctrine in the United States Army, but we read doctrine. And then the other thirds, we would go out to the field, and then we would do uh, some combat engineer missions. Um, my, my first duty station uh, on my orders, I, so you kind of, um, when, 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 I was in, uh, when I was a senior in college, you make a wish list of all the, of all the places you want to get stationed. And you know everyone has the same wish, wish list. So it's always Germany, Hawaii, Fort Carson, Colorado, and then Fort, Fort Lewis in, uh, in, in Washington State. Um, so I got, I got Fort Carson, and I was like, oh, cool. I grew up in Colorado. And I knew that would be a good bargaining chip. So I ended up actually trading with someone for, uh, for Vilsec, Germany. He, he wanted to be in Colorado because um, um, his mother had cancer, and he wanted to be um, closer to her rather than being in Germany. So, so I was able to trade with someone, and then I, uh, I got the duty station of Vilsack, Germany, and there's me, and here's Vilsack, Germany. Um, it's about an hour outside of Nuremberg. It's in, um, I'm trying to do the slide. A little screen. Yeah. Okay, there yeah, there's Vilsack, Germany. Um, there's the city of Nuremberg right there, and then up this road, that's Prague, about two hours away. It's in northern Bavaria, the this, the state of Bavaria and Oberfalds is the region. Um, right there, Grafenvir. So this is just the, the enclosure of Vilsack. I got this, thank you. So this was an entire training area here. And um, that training area was actually where um, Hitler would train his 100,000 man army primitive by the Treaty of Versailles. So before he did his like remilitarization in the 30s, like Hitler's army was all training in that area. And then, you know, when we came, we took it, and, it, and it's, been <laughs> it's been ours since then. So there was, um, w when I first got to, to Germany, um, the 2CR, 2nd Cavalry Regiment, we were in Vilsack. There was a heavy brigade combat team up here, but uh, they ended up actually uh, deactivating. Um, when that was one of the big missions when I first got to Germany, is that there were, there were four brigade combat teams there. There was a striker brigade combat team, which is what my unit was. Um, I think there might be a picture in your handouts. Yeah, there's a striker right here. It's a... It's an eight-wheeled vehicle um, that can carry, depending on the variant, they can carry up to 11 people. So it's basically a squad carrying vehicle. So there was one striker brigade combat team in Europe. There was the 173rd Airborne in Vicenza, Italy. And then there were two heavy brigades. And then um, I think the, the decision was that we're not going to fight tank battles in Europe anymore. So they sent the heavy brigades back. Um, and that was in about 2011. But it's kind of funny, because since Russia invaded the Ukraine, now we're sending tanks back to Europe. So I think they might regret their decision to send, send them home. So I, uh, I, I flew into Frankfurt Airport. Um, that was my first time in Europe. I've only been to um, South America and North America before then. So it was my first time in Europe. It was really cool. I was really excited about it. And then um, when, I, when I arrived at the 2CR, they, um, they were deployed to Afghanistan. Um, and they were, they were set to come back in like two or three months. So they didn't send um, any more lieutenants there anymore to Afghanistan, so they didn't have enough. So, so I was on um, the rear detachment. And one of, my, one of the first duties I had on rear detachment, it's, it's uh, very sad, but I was, a, I was a summary court martial officer. 
So I was responsible for um, basically for, for soldiers that were killed in Afghanistan. I had to send all their personal effects, everything they, they own, back to their, their parents. I had to mail a letter to their parents, letting them know the disposition of everything. And I had to like basically out-process them from the Army. And that was really, um, that was really kind of like a sobering moment for me when I, when I did this, this. The process took probably like two months. And yeah, it was just really sobering to me. It kind of reminded me like this is real. And I mean, since then, I kind of like took everything I did in the Army way more seriously. And it kind of gave me like um, a, a real sense of reverence about like what we do is really important. So that, that, was, that was the first job I had when I was in, in, in Vilsack. And then, um, and then once Enid came back, I transferred to the engineer troop. I became um, the engineer third platoon leader. And at that time, we, uh, we started, th they finished their redeployment operations. So in redeployment, when a unit gets back from Afghanistan, a lot of people will either go to schools, they'll go to different duty stations. So there's kind of a big turnover of us. So I think it was about a 60 to 70% turnover of personnel in the unit at that time. And then once you complete that, you kind of basically get ready for the next deployment. Um, before, before we got ready for the, the next deployment, um, since by that point, the United States, we, um, we withdrew from Iraq, and we had far less troops in Afghanistan. So they actually had a little more time in the operations tempo to do some other operations. So they, um, I think it was like a, a two and a half year gap between Afghanistan um, deployments. Um, prior to that, like during the Iraq surge, sometimes it was like less than a year. Um, so they, uh, they did. Um, they did, it, was the, it was the first time a striker brigade combat team did this. They, they kind of did a, a high, tempo or high tempo operations, so not counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, but fighting an enemy pretty similar to the Soviet Union or like a near peer with technology and tactics. So we, we spent um, nine months training how to basically fight the Russians, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we did a lot of training missions. Like I spent most of my time as a second lieutenant out in the field. Um, that's, um, so I was, um, the en engineers, they're responsible for mobility, counter mobility, and survivability. I was uh, the third platoon, so it, how it works is that the, the regiment has three manu maneuver squadrons, so one, two, and three, they're infantry squadrons, and then the fourth squadron is recon, and there are three engineer platoons for the entire regiment. And each platoon supports one squadron um, in the training missions. Is a squadron like a company then? Uh, a, a squadron is like a battalion. Yeah. The reason I say uh, squadron is because it's cavalry. And then when I say troop, um, that's, that's the equivalent of a company. Um, yeah. Let me know if you have, if you have any questions. <laughs> oh, did I? Yeah. Did I keep switching back and forth? Yeah, cavalry, they, always do, they, they just like to do th things differently so they feel special. You know, sorry if you're cavalry. I like cavalry. Um, so um, there's a there's actually this is a training. This is my third third squad. So actually, one vehicle squad they support one troop, one company in the field. So this is a that's an engineer squad vehicle. It's a variant of the striker. So they have rollers on the front, and the the purpose of those rollers is to roll over the ground, and they actually uh, will activate. Um, I think a lot the majority of uh, anti-vehicle mines and um, sometimes in anti-personnel mines. So this is during a combined arms breach. Um, this, th there's a German Leopold tank there. Those things are pretty cool and scary. I wouldn't want to fight the Germans anytime soon. There's a engineer squad vehicle. So the rollers, they would, uh, they would, bl they would blow up any mines. And in that process, usually the rollers are destroyed. And then those things in the back there, those actually, they fire little flags down to gra into the ground to mark a lane so the infantry and the cavalry can then move through after the engineers do the breach through an obstacle or a minefield. And, yeah. And then actually before this, there was a, there was a vehicle. Um, th this, is, this is a training mission. There's no like real mines here, so everything was like notional. And actually before that vehicle, uh, there was a vehicle with a mine plow that would just move through and move all the, all the mines across. So, Where does the driver's step here from? The driver is right there. You might just be able to see. Um, he has like these little periscopes he looks through. 
he has these, um, no, they're not, they're not actually periscopes. You can look directly through them. But most of the time, there's like a little video screen right here. Um, so he can like drive during, uh, it's like uh, glow in the dark. So he can drive during black light hours. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, um, Strikers are actually a, a pretty good vehicle for um, like IEDs and mines. They're pretty mine resistant. Like the, the shape of the hole, it's kind of designed to uh, deflect um, um, landmines or improvised, improvised explosive devices. Um, the strikers here, these are actually the, some of the oldest strikers in the Army. So they broke down a lot, and we had a lot of maintenance issues. Um, I think they actually, yeah, this is, like the, this is like the first or second brigade in the Army to get these vehicles. And um, so how it works is that this just has a flat hole. But for the strikers in Afghanistan, they, uh, they modded them so it's a V-hole, so the, so the blast would go off to the side. So yeah, these these the, when we um when when units go to Afghanistan, typically they don't take their equipment, their vehicle equipment with them. They go to Afghanistan and then get completely new equipment and they sign for it there. Um, so what what kind of armament do you have on a striker vehicle like that? Uh oh man, I want to say it's just like two three inches of armor. It's very it's very light. Oh, do you have any weapons? Yes. Oh, so so the weapon systems. Um. For the, for the engineer squad vehicles, um, for, for my vehicle, it was a Mark 19, a grenade launcher. And then for the three squad vehicles, they just had an M2 50 cal weapon system. And it's, uh, it's a, for, for the engineer vehicles, it's, it's a remote weapon system. So the gunner would be down looking at a video screen, and then he'll be controlling the weapon system with the remote control. And I mean, that's cool and stuff, but those electronics break down a lot. <laughs> so so when, we, um, when we did some gunnery missions, I think in our troop we had like, uh, we, we had thir 13 strikers in our trooper company, and there were only two that were working at the time. So, so, so that was kind of really annoying for all the gunnery crews to go through, and and um, m so maintenance was a big problem with strikers. Like they're great vehicles, they they look great on paper, but they they uh, you know like anything they have. Main, maintenance issues. That thing looks really big, just judging from the, the four troops with the orange vest. And the, the thing must be 40 feet long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty long. It's a pretty long vehicle. I mean, yeah, in the back here. So you have the driver right here, and then I'll show you more pictures later. That's where the the gun is, the weapon system, and then the gunners underneath. The the truck commander, vehicle commander, is right there, and in the back there's they're actually of. Uh, Four seats on each side, so you can have eight people in the back. So yeah, they're actually pretty, pretty nifty vehicles. Quick question: How do yes. rollers detect mines? Those do. So those don't defect, detect mines. They're heavy enough to activate the mine. So when you're rolling, they're on the ground. Yes. Like tires. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're pretty. They're pretty heavy. Yeah. Um, uh, how would? How would they last? If you roll over a mine, would it blow that thing off, or were they, were they solid enough that you could roll over several mines? I think they can roll over several mines, but I think at, at some point you're going to have to replace the rollers. Like I think, I think they designed it so you can roll over enough just to do one breaching operation. But um, I mean, one thing with engineers is that they don't like build things to last very long because they get killed pretty fast. So they probably, they probably didn't think that far ahead. <laughs> uh, so are these vehicles pretty new in the war? I mean, because early on you heard all these stories about IEDs killing soldiers. Mm -hmm. So does this come in after that? Because now you don't hear about it as much. I, b I believe this was being planned since the 80s. And it, it, came, it came in, in, in around 2003. Um, this actually. Um, uh, the, the, yeah, these vehicles, it's like its own brigade combat team. It's kind of seen as like an infantry brigade combat team, but since they have strikers, they're more mobile, so they have a longer range. They can have larger area of operations. So it's pretty much just like an armored personnel carrier. It's kind of like the, uh, uh, I don't know if this is correct, but kind of like an improvement of like the Bradley vehicle. It's just like the new... Um, the new platform they've used. Does that answer your question? Well, I guess what I'm asking is if, if early on, you know, in the war in Afghanistan, Humvees? You didn't, yeah, the IEDs, and it didn't seem like they were fighting anything to prevent that. Because mm -hmm. they could 
set them off with cell phones or whatever. And then you find these guys rolling along with mines. And so did these guys, did this come into effect later on during the Iraq War? I actually, so I think the first Striker Brigade combat team was around 2003. So just right at the start of the war. So they've kind of... Um, we did have them early on. We did have them early on, but um, I don't know how many Striker Bay combat teams there are in the Army. Roughly about you know a quarter of the Army has these vehicles. And then the rest are you know light infantry, paratroopers, and heavy with, with uh, tanks and Bradleys. Well, the big issue early on was we had the Humvee vehicles. Right, right. And they weren't armored at all. So you know any sort of explosive test would decimate you know, the riders on And so that started the whole issue to try and, you know, provide vehicles that have more armor protection uh, against IEDs. But that still is a problem. Are you guys asking if those replace the Humvees? No. no. I mean, they actually have MRAPs, you know, yeah. which is yeah. a vehicle that's replacing the Humvees, right. that they are designed to survive an IED right. blast right. for a mile. But the big issue was we deployed with just basically Humvees in Iraq and just got decimated by IEDs. Yeah, we weren't ready for it. Yeah, I mean, this was just a striker unit, so they had strikers, but like, um, t as the war kind of moved on, they created mine resistant armor protected MRAP vehicles. And um, that's what uh, that's what like the infantry units drove in Afghanistan. But, uh, but our unit, when we did deploy, we did have these vehicles. And they were slightly modified to be more um, IED resistant. So I mean, while I was in Germany, I did a lot of traveling. That's the I'll just show some of these real quick. Um, that's the Arc de Triomphe in uh, Paris, France, and uh, it's actually pretty cool. I didn't know this, but their tomb of the unknown soldier is right there, and they have an eternal flame going on. So that was th I thought that was pretty cool to see. Uh, that's me in Normandy, Mont Saint Michel in France. Um, pretty cool place. That's low tide, of course. Um, that's Iceland, big. I recommend going there. Direct flights from DIA, Iceland Air. You can get them for probably pretty cheap, like 600 bucks. But yeah, it's a really, really cool country. It's like a different planet. Then they have all kinds of geysers there. And that's Oktoberfest. Yeah, that's part of Germany, I'm sure. Yeah. I kind of like am bummed being in the United States when I order a beer. It's always so small. I'm just like, don't even, I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> it's like, why don't you just give it to me in a Dixie cup? Um, and then we, we did a, when we were there, we did a, we did a staff ride in the Battle of Sedan in France. And then we kind of looked at the Battle of the Bulge too. So, so yeah, just the staff ride is we, all the, um, so a lot of the leaders in the in four squadron, we went to uh, Sedan. And then we had a historian and we kind of like walked the battlefields and we just talked about like what the, what the commanders did to maneuver and achieve results. And that's one of the, the forts on the Maginot line. And as you may know, they weren't so effective because the Germans went around through Belgium and Netherlands. Uh, that's Big Ben, me, me in, in London. I like, I like London because people speak English there. It's pretty cool. My, my German was terrible. I, I could only understand like 10% of what Germans said. And that's me in, uh, in, in Brussels, Belgium. Absolutely beautiful city. And then that's from Austria in St. Anton. I did a lot of skiing while I was there, whenever I had the chance. And there's a picture from, from Switzerland. That's near the town of Luzerne. And this is uh, Dubrovnik in Croatia. And anyone here watch uh, Game of Thrones? The show Game of Thrones? That's uh, where King's Landing was filmed in that city there. So. Oh, really? Black uniforms and their, and their automatic weapons. Oh, yeah. How long ago was that? Oh, about three years ago. Oh, three years ago? Oh, wow. Wow. And you can still see the ropes that have been replaced from the bombings during the, during the creation of war. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they, they the 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 oh, really? Wow, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't notice that when I was there. That's cool. Yeah. You been there, too? Yeah. To Dubrovnik? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful place. Um, that's the Forum in Rome, Italy. And then that's uh, the Italian Riviera. They have all these cool little towns there near the cliffs. Um, 
you know, those are just awesome. The Italian Riviera, it's kind of like a cheaper French Riviera. So if you ever want to go um, to Europe, I'd recommend checking out the Italian uh, Riviera. There's me looking at the ocean. Budapest, Hungary. And that's, uh, that's just in southern Germany, right near the border of Austria. So this is kind of, um, these are all pictures from in Vilsack, Germany, this is some of the training we did. Um, that, that's taken out of the, fr the front of my striker. And in the front of us, we, for all the strikers, we had a roll of uh, concertina wire, barbed wire, to create, a, to create any hasty obstacles if we needed to. Uh, this was during a uh, big old operation. It's called like, the Decisive Action Training Environment. It was, when it started, it was something like the largest NATO operation in Europe since the Cold War. And it was the United States and pretty much every NATO ally. And they were kind of like testing your unit's effectiveness to maneuver as a brigade or a regiment. Brigade and regiment are the same thing. And during that time, I was uh, an engineer platoon leader. So I would just drive around from um, unit to unit that ever needed uh, uh, engineer support. There's, uh, there's the M2 weapon system. That's actually, so basically when they do these training environments, it's kind of like a big game of laser tag. We actually um, attach uh, sensors to all the vehicles and then to our vest to our people. And then when you fire your weapon um, with a blank, it will shoot out a laser beam that will hit the people's sensors. And then, and then when that happens, you will, you will die. And then you have to play dead. And then there's actually a place where you go play dead and you wait there until your unit fills out the paperwork to requisition for a new person. So then you are actually, you come back alive and then you return to battle. So <laughs> it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of funny. But yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a giant game of uh, laser tag. And yeah, that's just driving over German fields. Sometimes we actually, we accidentally drove over uh, farmers' crops quite a bit, cause, which pisses them off. But um, they love it because the US government reimburses them a lot. So your tax dollars at work. And then, yeah, there's just us driving along the German roads. What was kind of weird about this operation is that the first part of it was, um, was actually fought just out in the German countryside in the towns and stuff. For some reason, um, we got somehow, cause since the Germans were involved, they gave us permission to fire our weapon systems, not in the training areas. So we were just like driving along the roads and firing our weapons at the enemy that were there. So that was, that was kind of interesting to like maneuver, maneuver through. And of course, like anything, there's, there's traffic jams and stuff. And I have a question too on the wire you had in the front. Um, yes. If you had to practice that, what would you construct or how would you set that up as a practice if you ever really needed it to combat? Yeah, um, I, I think mainly the ones for the vehicles is when, when the vehicle's in a battle position at night, I think it's mainly to put around the vehicle just so the enemy doesn't come up and like ambush and like drop grenades or sabotage the vehicle. I think it's mainly for that. But for um, for um, engineers, when, whenever we had to build an obstacle, usually we would have three strands and set them up and have two strands on the floor and then one on top of it. And then I guess that was just enough that when a tank would drive over it, it would um, mess up their treads and it would eventually disable the vehicle. So a lot of the time we just did three strands of concertina wire um, in like a pyramid formation. Does that answer your question? Cool. There's the M2 weapon system. Sometimes the roads got really narrow. And yeah, there's one of the, there's one of the vehicles there with uh, one of the engineer squad vehicles with the mine plow. Just driving through people's houses. <laughs> it's kind of fun. We got lost a lot. Can you imagine having you guys drive in your front yard? Yeah, we, we, did, we, did, we did drive through people's yards. Ask for directions. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's, the, there's a mine plow in action. We, we, we did have to use it a couple times. But, but those yeah. aren't rollers. That looks like a plow, kind of a blade. Yeah, that, this, is, this is just a blade. And the purpose of this is to push mines out of the way. And then the purpose of the rollers is to proof the lane, to make sure that all the mines are um, disabled. Um, I, I think those were kind of just to like, kind of like, uh, loosen up the ground a little bit, so that, so that, to help out the plow when it was. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, there's the there's the back of the striker. Um, that's my vehicle. Those are the flags I was telling you about that shoot in the ground that proof the lane. Uh, we got 
fuel tanks on the back, and then we have like a bunch of water tanks on top. And yeah, this training operation was uh, was a month long, so we had we had a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> Uh, that that was actually the biggest problem for this operation was logistics. Um, the uh, we, it was G, JP8 fuel was what we used, and just uh, I think it was like w once a day there would be uh, there would kind of be like a mobile refueling station. It would change every day. It would come out over the radio like, hey, units, go to this point for this day to get to get fuel. And yeah, I mean you're kind of always expected that uh, you had to keep your vehicles fueled, and if you kind of screw that up, you might get fired. So you're always like. You're always doing like checks with um, your team, making sure every every, every vehicle in the unit has uh, has has enough fuel. What's the miles per gallon on one of those? Oh <laughs> man, I don't know. It's, it's probably single. It's definitely single digits. It probably depends on how how fast you're going. They go pretty quick. They can go like up to I think like 70 on the autobahn. Um, we didn't do that, but I, I heard people did that. I I didn't want to get fired, so I didn't risk it. Um, Yeah, just driving through people's lawns and stuff. So uh, this is kind of us in a, in, a, in a training assembly area. That's the engineer squad vehicle. Um, on the back there, that's actually a pretty cool device. It's called a it's called a Miklik. It's it's called like a mine clearing line charge. So it's that entire um, back there. That's just full of C4 explosives, and that right there is a rocket. So they launch a rocket um, over a minefield. And then the C4 is kind of like in a rope, and they're all like attached to the rocket. So it will the rocket will launch an entire line of C4 over a minefield, and then you detonate the C4, and then it clears the minefield. So that's part of the breaching technique. So what happens is that you would first fire the Miklik, blow up all the mines, and then go through with the, the mine plow, and then that, that pushes all the mines that were detonated by the C4 out of the way, and then you have the roller go over to proof it to kind of like make sure. So you kind of have some redundancy there just to make sure that um, the, the, you can get through the minefields. A lot of, lot of Germans were very interested. A lot of them came out and they were waving at us and stuff. And yeah, it was, it was kind of funny. They could like come up and try to talk to us and we're like, no, we're busy. <laughs> No, we didn't give autographs. There's a combat selfie. Um, oh, that was my fault. I uh, I had a plow in the front of my vehicle, and I, I hit someone's fence. So, yeah, just this German town person's fence. And he came out, he was pretty cool about it, but um, we had to, like, go out and take pictures, and then... We have like these people that watch us call observers controllers, and they take pictures, and then the German will petition um, to his local government, and then they will build the U.S. for all these damages. So I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally my fault. I thought I thought I had the turn. I thought I had the turn, but the plow, the plow messed it up. Um, so not in um, not in not in the platoon I was in, but in the fourth platoon, they had uh, bridging vehicles. So. There were four in the entire regiment, and they were all in the, the the fourth platoon in the engineer troop. And that is a bridge that will deploy, and I believe it can cross a 13 meter gap, and any vehicle in the regiment can go over it. I just think I, I don't think it's heavy enough for tanks. Um, this is it's not a combat bridge, so it's not armored, and you're kind of expected when you do the bridging operation when you cross the river. You're kind of expected, it takes a long time, you're kind of expected to have the area secure and there can't be a lot of um, firepower. So this is not an assault bridge, this is more just like bridging um, uh, a river casually. How much length is there on that? I mean, how, how long is that piece put together? Uh, so it, 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 can, it can, 13 meters, so I think that's feet. 39 feet. feet. Yeah, I think it's a little, I think it's a little longer, but I think there's the, that manual says 13 meters, so. Brian, but when you guys are out doing this stuff in Germany, you obviously don't get permission beforehand. You know, the army, they can just come and go as they please in Germany. And for, for, for what? Well, you know, like you're out doing these maneuvers. Oh, yeah, we have to get permission. Oh, you, you yeah. Get permission up front? 
Yeah, we have to get like permission from the German government for for everything that's like done outside. Yeah, yeah, I always have to get permission. Is that a problem or are they pretty cooperative? Uh, I think they're pretty cooperative. Yeah, I, I never had to deal with that. I think that's more like what like um, colonels and yeah. such deal with. So not really not my problem. Yes, we would do training operations with them. Um, See, so yeah, I think that's why they gave us permission. But when we're out there, we have you know French, British, Italians, Romanians, Bulgarians, Albanians, all the Balkan states um, and the Baltic states, and yeah, they're all they're out there doing these training missions together. It's kind of funny because um, our our allies do things a little differently. The the Germans will not do training if there's a soccer game on, and um, priorities. 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 Yeah, which is actually I think kind of cool, but yeah, we were I was trying to plan for a mission, and they're like, ah, oh, we we're going to watch the Bayern Munich game. And I was like, cool, I'll go back to work. Um, so they kind of Europeans do things a little differently. Um, the Slovakians, um, no offense if you're Slovak, but one time they didn't go out on a mission because it was raining outside. Um, there's yeah, there's our entire platoon. There's there's the vehicle I had, so that's the plow that that jacked up that poor German's fence, and then we, the the platoon sergeant he would drive the Humvee. We had these uh, flat racks with uh, a lot of our supplies we carry around. So there's strands of concertina wire, and then those are the posts we would use to put in the ground to make uh, to make the obstacles. That's just. We'd set up, uh, the, the, the soldiers would set up hammocks and, and chill during downtime. This is all in an assembly area, so this is not tactical here. <coughs> uh, I think that's chow. And then, um, so when we did our, our training, um, we would do uh, all the explosives we had. They were basically like powder, like <laughs> they, would, they would puff powder. And they actually make a pretty good, pretty good uh, bang, but yeah. So, so there's kind of like uh, what it looked like when we did it. And, when um, we did these charges, um, those are those are all like C4 blocks, and then those are all cratering ch charges. So what happens is that when um, when you're driving over a road and you don't want the enemy to go down it, you can set up the cr cratering charge, place the explosive on the ground, and create a huge hole in the ground so the enemy won't be able to go down that road. So we would we would set up these cratering charges, and just whenever um, whenever like a maneuver commander is like, hey, engineers, block that road, we would go in lay down those charges and then blow it up. And then um, the purpose of the C4 blocks is that during during some breaching operations, this was it's, it's kind of a, a suicide mission, but they, they would always they would always send the, the youngest private out to crawl through the minefield and then he would feel for the mines with his hands and then he would place the C4 on it and then crawl around it and then that's how he would like breach the minefields. Um, but hopefully the United States will never have to do that in conflict. That is Suicide mission. I can't believe we actually like practiced that. Well, that was the main way we did it back in the. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad, we, I'm glad we don't do that in Afghanistan. Don't be the youngest private, right? Yeah, don't be the youngest private. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's uh, so in the four platoon, the platoon that had the bridging equipment, they also had some bulldozers. So they would just build tank ditches. And stuff. So, we built some huge tank ditches there. All, all of the, all of this stuff with, um, with the explosives and then digging into the ground, the ditches, um, that was done. This is done on the Hohenfels training area. It's about like tw 20 miles south of uh, the Vilsack area. Um, So some of the there are many variants of the striker. So you had like the basically infantry fighting vehicles. This is called a mobile mobile gun system. They have four of these per infantry trooper company, and basically it's like a big gun and it's kind of oh man I don't know I don't do you know how the big the gun is? I don't I don't know I don't know the millimeters. I think it's the same as a tank. Oh yeah yeah. It's basically the same barrel as a tank. Yeah. If it would be one of like, <coughs> Yeah. So so they had these in the regiment. They also had strikers that were um, um, fitted for uh, medical evacuation. So they had like a <coughs> they had a, a bed in there to transport casualties out. Um, there were also other variants where the back would actually open it up, and there'd be a, a mortar system 
Um, those were in the in the mortar in the mortar platoons, and then you had the scout vehicles with basically this really advanced, expensive uh, telescope. Brian, are those tires solid rubber, or are they, are they tires? They are air inflated. It's actually a central inflation system, and I think like the pump is strong enough they can run for a while on a flat. Yeah. Yeah, the biggest problem with maneuvering these vehicles is the tires wouldn't break a lot, but just because it's Germany, everything's wet, every, you get stuck all the time. So, so like um, with, with fuel and logistics, recovery is huge. So, um, all these vehicles, they have a winch in the front, and I feel like sometimes during training, you spend half your time um, getting your vehicle out of a ditch or something. So, I'm really good at getting unstuck. Yeah, sometimes the forests get pretty intense when we drive around. There's the Mark 19 weapon system. And then those are, I forgot who those are. Those are some of our NATO allies. More nap time. Cards. It snows a lot in Germany, if anyone didn't know that. It's it pretty cold. Mind blow. So that right there, that um, trailer on the treads, it's uh, it's called a volcano. It is a hasty minefield laying device. So they f they fire mines out of there, and then everywhere behind the vehicle will be a minefield. So um, we would use those to kind of deny the enemy and maneuver space. So that was pretty cool. We didn't actually. Um, um, run them with, with real mines ever. It was all just like How fake rockets. Yes. I believe you can actually you, you, you program them. So you can um, you can program them so they activate at a certain time. So I think it's kind of risky but it, let's say like you want the minefield to be clear at one time but you want the mines to activate at another time. But I think like that's actually the computer system there. And then you, you'll program all the mines so you put in there. And then you kind of stack them in there one by one, and they just shoot the mountain. I forgot the dimensions of the minefield. It's something like it can do, I think, like 80 by 100 meters is the minefield you'll be able to create. That's in the back of a striker. Those are, those are all our kits that we wear. That's the, um, that's the gunners little area there, and that's where I hung out. Um, that area there, that's where I slept. It's about a foot and a half wide. It's fun. This is my map. And then, yeah, so the, there's a soldier with his legs, and he would be out the back and pulling security. Did somebody ask, uh, well, what's uh, the crew on one of those? Is it like five or six people? Uh, yes, typically they can carry up to eleven. It uh, it, it kind of depends on you know how many people are in the platoon. One thing that was kind of difficult about being stationed in um in Europe is that there were only two um, brigade combat teams there, and so all the taskings we have with our allies from like international treaties from ten years ago. Uh, we always had to provide soldiers for like training missions um, to, to do with um, all of our allies. So sometimes like when we went to the field, I had in my platoon, I had 28 assigned, but I remember there were some missions where I'd go to the field with only 12 people because people would be tasked out for months at a time. So that was one, one of the challenges was just kind of um, to lead and make sure everyone's trained, even though we had all these, uh, ab these treaty obligations with, uh, with our allies. So that kind of sucked. I mean, there's a, I think we're, that's the wash rack. You know, when you return to the motor pool, they had to be perfectly clean, and we get, we're we just getting dirt everywhere. There's a German Leopold tank. Um, there was actually a, so the volcano, the, the minefield device I just showed, um, my platoon, we were, uh, we were laying a minefield, and we got ambushed by four of these, and we lasted, I think, about eight seconds, and I was just like, wow. But yeah, they wiped us off. And how it works with the Germans, um, when they, uh, in their training, when they destroy engineer equipment, they get an extra day off of work. So they're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of motivated to destroy engineer equipment. 
That's what they told us. So they, they said, they said, oh, we were so excited when we saw in the woods and we saw the Miklik and the engineer vehicles. So, yeah. All right, back to more civilian related stuff. That's skiing in Austria. That's uh, Chamonix Mont Blanc in France, the tallest mountain in Europe. Really scary skiing in there. All right, now now on um, now on to uh, Afghanistan. Um, so after I finished my platoon leader time, I uh, transitioned into uh, a leadership role. I was going to be uh, an advisor to the Afghan National Army. Um, my it was something called a security force uh, advisory team, and we would basically advise the Afghans on how to be a better army, and we teach them how to basically. We teach them like what we've learned in the American Army over 230 or whatever years, and we kind of try to improve their operations so they can defend their country on themselves. And my, my team, it was uh, it was a brigade team, so we have, we all advise like brigade staff, and I advise the brigade engineer. So um, the the biggest thing in Afghanistan, of course, was IEDs. So we did a lot of IED training for the Afghans. Um, we I, I, I would organize and I would bring out specialists. Um, like American civilian contractors that would kind of show them how to use the Afghan equipment, like all the metal detector equipment, and then how to how to look for IEDs in Afghanistan. Um, what rank were you then? I was a first lieutenant at this point. I was a first lieutenant at this point, and then the the guy I advised, he was a uh, he was an Afghan lieutenant colonel. Um, he was about 50 years old. He fought the Soviets back in the day. And he was actually uh, he was actually a really cool guy. I, I liked him. Some people, some of the Afghans are a little sketchy, but I, I liked him. I trusted him. Um, he had he had two sons and two daughters. Um, both his daughters were in engineering school, so it was just good to see that you know he believes that women should have an education and stuff. And he was from he was from Kabul. Um, so 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 that place there, um, this uh, the the second Mobile Strike Force Brigade. This was the Afghan unit. They were a quick reaction force for all of southern Afghanistan. So Kandahar, Zabu, Urugzan, uh, Helmand province, whenever an Afghan commander needed immediate assistance, the, the MSF would deploy there quickly. They took orders directly from uh, the Ministry of Defense in Kabul. And yeah, a lot of the time, so we, we were at, uh, we were in Kandahar province, and the forward operating base we were at was called Camp Lindsay. It was a small camp with only about like 800 American soldiers. And then we were attached adjacent to uh, Camp Hero, an Afghan base, and there was a, a core unit there. So I think there were about 30,000 Afghan soldiers there. So since we didn't have to go um, outside of the bases, um, we would, when we would go to the Afghan compound and advise them, we would drive in forerunners and, and strikers. So we weren't too worried about um, about have, about having IEDs on an Afghan army base, we saw it as pretty safe. They uh, they would do their own security on their bases, so it was basically all about trusting trusting our allies. Um, this uh, I was I was the guy. This was a sixty five million dollar construction project that we transferred to the Afghans when we were there. Um, it was uh, enough facilities for um, two battalions worth of soldiers. And yeah, it was huge. It was huge. It was uh, cr created by the Corps of Engineers, and we transferred um, that to them in in 2000 in 2004. And yeah, those are all the the new buildings. Those those buildings right there, those are the barracks, and then um, that structure right there with the sandbags. That's kind of a bunker. So whenever there's uh, rockets coming in or mortars, um, the soldiers would theoretically go inside there, and they'd be safe because the buildings are not armored on top. Um, there's my there's my team leader, Lieutenant Colonel Bala. Um, and there's a there's a, a female Afghan linguist. There's a linguist right there and a linguist right there. Um, there. Oh, there's actually there's the guy I advise right there with the with the bald hair, the Afghan general. Or and the, there's the Afghan general in front of him. He had a he uh, he was a brigadier general in brigade in their army. Brigadier generals command their brigades. He uh, was um, an Uzbek. So um, one thing about the Afghan culture is that um, it's very much about the family and the tribe and tribe before everything. So he was um, an, an Uzbek guy. So most of the leaders in the, in the Afghan unit were of Uzbek descent. Um, it didn't matter how smart you were, if you weren't Uzbek, you would not be promoted in that brigade. 
So there's a lot of nepotism, and it's just really hard for, um, for Americans, because we have a pretty egalitarian society. It's very difficult for us to think like that. You know, I don't, like, we're not, um, we're not, um, we're not, I don't, I don't want to say it's like racist, but like, we don't, we don't really care about our tribe or our, our ethnicity, but to them it's like everything. It's more important than anything. First comes family, and then comes tribe, and then there's everybody else. That creates a lot of problems. It, do, it, does, it does create a lot of problems. It does create a lot of problems. It's a lot of strife, and yeah, it's just, um, that's one thing like um, they had to kind of teach your advisors, is we had to kind of like get outside of our American military mindset and think like, and think like them. So, we're, I mean, we're not there to change their culture. We're not trying to tell them how to do things. We're more trying to create small incremental improvements to make them be a better army. We're not gonna, we're not gonna like get rid of racism in their culture. We're not, we're not gonna do that. That's something that takes generations. Is it, uh, but the era you were in, down Kandahar and that South West Park, isn't that mainly Pashtun? Yes, it's mainly it's mainly Pashtun. So it, it, it's kind of um, weird how the the Afghan army works. Um, most of the officers are not Pashtun, but a lot of the enlisted people are. So most of the most of the officers kind of come from the north of the country, and they're like Uzbek, Hazara, and other tribes. So there's kind of uh, you kind of have like the the different um, races and tribes within the within the Afghan army. But yeah, mainly mainly in this area where we were in Kandahar, um, it's mainly the the Pashtun tribe. They speak top, they they speak Pashtun. Almost all the, the officers, they speak the language of Dari, which is kind of similar to um, Farsi, the, the Persian language. Um, but if you, um, they're, they're, they're still pretty different languages. So mainly um, the, the language I learned, I only learned a few phrases, not too much. But I, I, I mainly learned Dari. But when you go out and talk to like the local civilians, they speak Pashtun. Um, but yeah, most of the time, um, almost all the, the Afghans there, they're, they're from Kabul, from the north of the country. Very, very few people are from. Um, Kandahar. I mean, this is the this is like the birthplace of the Taliban. So I think um, most of the officers come from and soldiers come from the north. There's more of the the base we transferred to them. Um, they're really bad at running generators. They they don't maintain them. They break all the time, and they always ask the Americans to fix them, and we we don't. So um, this is actually kind of funny. All the buildings we built for the Afghans in Afghanistan, or at least from uh, a certain day forward, the insulation in the roof is flammable. So someone screwed that up. Um, <laughs> so every building in the Afghan army we built for them, I mean, we built it for them for free. They're all flammable. So this was actually one problem that was happening all throughout Afghanistan, is that there would be uh, sab saboteurs like um, the Taliban or Al Qaeda or whoever, they would start fires on the Afghan buildings to kind of try to sabotage the process. So th when when, uh, when the United States found out about that, we gave the Afghans all kind of flyers that said, "Do not light the roof on fire." And basically, that was telling all the people that didn't know the roof was flammable that the, that the roof was flammable. So then they would light the roof more on fire. So yeah, when we got there, they they have these fires that kind of happen, and um, yeah, they. The, the intelligence guy in the brigade, he said it was Al-Qaeda that did this. But I don't know, it's probably just some, some guy that was pissed about work. But yeah, uh, but yeah it's kind of a, a bad decision. I wonder if anyone got fired over that. It saves money, though. Um, there's me. There's a, his name is L Lieutenant Colonel Muhammad Nasser Zaman. And um, these are the uniforms they wore. There's a, an Afghan non-commissioned officer, and there's an Afghan, an Afghan soldier. Um, when I was there, I, uh, we, would, we, we would take our uniforms off and we went to the Afghan compound because it's almost like a show of uh, manhood when you're not wearing your armor. And they'll take you more seriously, and they'll be more willing to listen to you. And it also shows trust, saying, I'm not wearing my armor. I'm here. I'm vulnerable to you. But but when we but when um, the advisors when we would take off our armor the uh, at any given time we had to have two soldiers with uh, their with their M4 weapon system and their full kit next to us and those were called guardian angels and they were just basically guarding us the entire time we did the advising mission um, we I just had a I just had a pistol to my side that was my um, protection. <coughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We have yeah we had bodyguards um with us the whole time. Were there any green on blue attacks while you were there? Yes, but not not um in our part of the country. So the um so f for the entire Afghan I'm not sure about Iraq, but for the entire Afghanistan conflict. The number one um, killer of U.S. troops was IEDs, and the second was green on blue attack. A green on blue attack is when an, an Afghan soldier shoots an American soldier. Um, there's a lot of reasons it happens. Um, number one, they may be a, a Taliban operative that has infiltrated the Afghan army. And they are also an honor culture. So if you say something that will insult them, they are honor bound to kill you. And that is legal for them. So you have to be very sensitive like what you what you say to them. And actually, a lot of um, s some green on blues, like we, uh, I, we had to read about all about them and know what to do. A lot of the green on blues were, um, they're kind of arguments that started between the Afghans and the Americans. And then the Afghan eventually felt he was insulted. And then he would decide he would have to, wanted to kill the Americans. So there's a lot of reasons it happened. Um, we, were, we were very lucky. We had very good relationships. Um, we were kind of taught, when everything get testy, we just kind of calm them down, be like, okay, you're right. And then some, sometimes in some situations, we would actually leave the Af Afghan compound, like when they got mad at each other and stuff. Um, it's, very, it's very awkward in the Army because uh, their officers will beat their soldiers. Um, the, the HHC commander, he had a big lead pipe. And whenever his soldiers didn't listen to him, he would go into his office, grab his lead pipe, and his NCOs would hold the soldier, and he would just beat him, beat his face in. And that's how they did discipline there. And whenever that happened, uh, we just left because it was just really like eerie. We're like, wow, what if like someone decides to like shoot him and stuff? Um, so yeah, that was that was very um, different to work with. Their uh, their command and control structure um, it's very rigid. Decisions are very much centralized. Um, it's it's one of the reasons the American Army is so great is that we have a strong core of non commissioned officers. And the the thing with the the Afghan Army is that the majority of Afghans are illiterate. They, they, they can't read. They can speak. They're, I mean, they're very smart people, but they can't necessarily read. So it's hard for them to read manuals. It's hard for them to learn things. And basically, the only people that can read, the majority of the, of the people that can read in the army are, are the officers. So they're kind of afraid to give any initiative or any command and control authority to the non-commissioned officers. So that's very difficult for us to work with. They. Uh, they kind of have a Soviet Union style command and control structure. Um, everything is centralized. Um, platoon leaders, squad leaders, team leaders basically can't do anything. Almost everything requires some general signature in their military. Everything's very slow. Uh, logistics is very difficult in the Afghan army. Um, I was the engineer officer, but the, uh, the logistics officer, he had the toughest time over there because he just had to work with, um, he had to work with all the Afghan logistics system. They, the, the Afghan commanders, so basically from MOD on down, they would hoard material and supply. And they would only give them the units if they did something for them. So it kind of became like a political bargaining chip, fuel and ammo. And sometimes they would actually sell the, the fuel to the, to the Taliban just to make some extra money. There's a, there's a lot of corruption in their government and military. And we're kind of taught to accept that. Um, we, we were told not to call them out on that because they might kill us if we do. So, there, yeah, there's a lot of there's a level of uh, corruption that you have to accept, and it's pretty much everywhere. For example, in the unit we were in, um, the uh, the Afghan company commander, he would steal drugs like uh, painkillers from the hospital, and then he would sell them to his soldiers. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this stuff just like happens all the time, and. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just really hard um, as an American to kind of work with that. That's when, uh, that's when we played CSU. I think we lost. So those, those vehicles in the back there, those are the, uh, those are the MRAPs. So um, those, weren't our, those weren't our units, but um, that's like what the infantry would ride around in. Um, it's kind of like an improvement of the Humvee. They're, more, uh, <coughs> they're basically better designed for uh, a counterinsurgency conflict with IEDs and ambushes with uh, RPGs and so forth. I actually lost a lot of my pictures. Um, so these are all the ones I had from work. My memory card crashed. First world problems. And yeah, when we were there, we built the big, uh, 
they're kind of on the side of the Afghan compound, so those are about eh, about three meters. We there were a bunch of bases closing down Afghanistan, and we shipped them to uh, this area. And then the Afghan engineer, we uh, we basically built a, a new fob. So what are the blast walls? Yes, those are those are those are blast walls. Um, I think uh, I think like an RPG will blow them up, but I think like most uh, most small arms fire will block them. And it kind of if there's like a blast, they'll kind of deflect some of it upwards. Oh, I went the wrong way. My bad. What did you do for water? I mean, it's a very dry area. Like your base there. Yeah, yeah. It was it was just uh, it was just north of the desert, so there were kind of some crops around us. But I mean, we couldn't drink their water, so it was all bottled water for us. Yeah, everything. It was all shit bottled water. We didn't drink any of their water. So when you when you first start an advising mission, um, they. Um, I mean, Afghans, they are a very uh, social culture. So you kind of need to like talk and get to know them for an entire month. And you need to get to know them. And if you talk to them about business before that, it's considered very rude. So that's one thing that's hard as an American. Like, we're all about down to business. Let's get this over with. I want to go home to my family. They kind of like to chill and talk. Everything's slow. No one wears watches. Um, when we go there, the first 30 minutes of the conversation is just polite. Um, discussion of topics like the weather, your family, sports, and then you kind of need to talk about that before uh, before you get down to business. And yeah, it's just uh, you kind of get used to like just shooting, shooting, shooting around, and you, you get released to awkward um, situations. Takes some getting used to. Yeah, it does take some getting used to, and you have to act uh, very genuinely interested in it. Because they, uh, even though like they, a lot of them don't know how to read, they're they're very attuned to social cues and signals. Because you know they they're not glued to their iPhones all day like our culture. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, and they they can tell if you're being genuine. So you're kind of like an actor, a little bit. And then your your kind of job is to uh, manipulate them into doing things that are in the United States' interests and their interests ultimately. And there, yeah, there's one of the the bodyguards, also known as guardian angels, keeping me alive some of their fuel trucks. Yeah, if you can, a lot of construction projects going on over there on their base. They didn't take offense to your bodyguards yet. No. They, there were some discussions like, there were some discussions. Like, they, they're like, you don't trust us. I'm like, and I just say, it's, it's our policy. Like, this is what a four-star general told us. I don't have a choice, you know? I can't do anything about it. I'm a first lieutenant. It's my excuse for everything <laughs> at the time. Uh, and yeah, there's just a. Uh, so they didn't trust the command part of that. They do. Yeah. I, I believe they do. There's their operations center, big map of Kandahar. So, what was the rest of your troop doing? I mean, you didn't go as an individual replacement. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I had I had an SVAT. The, the team had about, I think, 18 people on it. So we had personnel, intelligence, operations, a bunch of maintenance guys, medical. So we had an entire team um, that would each advise their uh, Afghan counterpart on their uh, on their like specialty. So I just advised them, the engineer mainly, and we we had a we had a troop um, that we were attached to, a pale horse troop, and they provided our security. And then when, when they weren't providing security for us, they were going out into the, it was something called the ground defense area. So anywhere around an airport, um, you have to make sure like the Afghans aren't, um, or the, the enemy, the Taliban, aren't sending mortar rounds into the airfield. So they would actually go do airfield defense missions. So they would go to like um, point of origin sites for mortars, and they kind of protected this, I think like 20 mile radius around the airfield. So they, they rotated between that mission and then uh, protecting us. And then eventually, um, we were able to convince the Afghans to go out and do some of the airfield defense missions with, uh, with, with the Americans. And they would do, uh, they would do uh, partnered operations together. And that was pretty cool because the Afghans, they don't take orders from their, they don't take orders from Americans. They take orders from their chain of command. So everything we change, we kind of have to convince them.
So there were no large operations going on in that province to clear Taliban out of. That was mainly in Helmand. What, one, one of the subordinate uh, battalions from our Afghan unit, they had a battalion in Helmand, and they had a Marine Corps SFAT team advising them because all the Marines were in Helmand, and they were doing uh, large operations. I tried to go there, but my commander didn't let me. This was funny. Um, so this is from an, an, an Afghan engineer unit. They would come and kind of plow the ground and make a motor field, and they would charge our Afghans fuel in order to do it. So that's just that's just how they work. His uh, yeah, there's the my Afghan counterpart. His sons love football, American football. So um, that's kind of like towards the end. I bought him and uh, bought him an American football, and he took it back to his uh, two sons in Kabul. It was actually pretty cool. We we talk about sports a lot. He's a good guy. He's actually getting to retire soon. Oh, he was a lieutenant colonel, yeah. Yeah, he was old school. It's kind of funny. He showed me all his IDs of like the Taliban regime and then like the old kingdom of Afghanistan. And for the Taliban regime, his hair is just everywhere because all the men had to grow out hair there. Um, so their uh, their septic tank, they uh, I guess they they screwed up the contract for the for taking out the septic water. So that's poo water they would use to irrigate their trees. Um, and the entire base kind of smelled like poop because they couldn't get rid of their septic water. <laughs> Works for them, you know? And then, yeah, there's me. Um, that's, uh, that's the Afghan engineer. That's his assistant. And that's one of the platoon leaders um, from down in Helmand province. And then that's just one of my friends. He's an interesting guy. He's a, I think he's like of Indian descent, so he spoke like Urdu. But yeah, the Afghans, they, they, they like, there's one of our interpreters, they, uh, they like Americans. Um, so I'm about an hour and I pretty much wrapped it up. So if anyone has any questions. Any other questions for Brian? What, what was the biggest learning experience for you? Uh, um, biggest learning experience. Just stay calm, <laughs> you know. Everything's be okay somehow. Like you just gotta stay calm and be composed. That's number one. Appearances matter, you know. So, yeah. When it's all said and done at the end. You think this whole thing is worth it politically or whatever? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know what to think. It's very complicated. I mean. It's tough. It's kind of it's kind of sad because I'm reading a lot like in Afghanistan how towns I thought were relatively safe are, are being taken over by uh, by the Taliban and a lot of the some some Taliban units are pledging loyalty to the ISIS. I'm friends with a lot of Afghans on Facebook and they're posting pictures and videos of some of the t ISIS atrocities over there. Like I don't even want to describe them. They're ridiculous, but yeah, it's sad. I mean, I don't I, I don't know what to think if it's worth it, but yeah, that's a Question for a politician somewhere. <laughs> I just, I just, I just did my part, you know. Well, so they what have the trouble they, in the middle of Chicago? They think they're being dissed. What, what's that? Sorry. The way you're talking about their racism mm -hmm. business, or how they worry about each other and their tribes. If they were in the middle of Chicago and somebody dissed them, how would they react? Well, hopefully, um, they'll adapt to our culture and they're kind of learn on it. Um, a lot of our Afghan linguists, they became linguists for the American army so they can get American citizenship. So they kind of know how Americans work and they want to be Americans. So a lot of um, the Afghan refugees that, that we've brought in over the years are actually, we're American linguists. So they know our culture pretty well and they kind of know like what's, what's expected of them and they want, to, they want to be Americans. A lot of our linguists, like they're really smart guys, they know five languages, they're hard workers and you know, frankly they've done more for American security than a lot of Americans have, and I have a lot of respect for them. But yeah, I just hope that when when they do come over, they kind of assimilate. Yeah, certainly the big challenge if you just look at the geography there. What do you see uh, in terms of what's around Afghanistan? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Every bullet, every vehicle, every gallon of diesel fuel, jet fuel, everything has to be transported, either flown in 
brought into Pakistan, and if they let us, they're not mad at us, taken over the Khyber Pass to Lugan here. Or we have to have arrangements with the Soviets. Well, now Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, one of them, to allow us to fly it into bases which we're building and supporting there, and then trucking it all the way into Afghanistan. Uh, and so if you thought, you know, uh, the battles in Kuwait or even Iraq were fun and games, there you could at least ship stuff by ship, and you didn't have far to lug it. Uh, here, they have to go forever. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, a nephew of mine who's been in the Marines over there said, now that we're withdrawing equipment back, we can't turn it over to the, the Afghans because they can't maintain it. So even some of these yeah. vehicles, you know, the big vehicles that we're in, if we don't bring it back, we're destroying it. <laughs> uh, you know, all sorts of gear. Uh, we have decided it's too expensive to bring it back, so we're just destroying it. And that, to me, is equally as sad. But again, the biggest sad thing to me is, you know, there are a lot of very fine Afghanis, you know, who've worked with us, who've committed, who want to do the best for their country. But if we precipitate, you know, totally withdraw and they collapse, they're going to be at the mercy of ISIS, the Taliban, you know, revenge killings. And of course, we're so scared now, we won't let anyone into our country. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are a lot of Iraqis who've been, you know, interpreters and everything. Can they come into our country? Heck no, mm -hmm. because we're scared to death about that. And that, to me, is the, you know, what makes it really sad. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, it's quite something, and we certainly respect what you guys all had to have to deal with. Yeah. And we're going to be there for a while and stuff. But anyway, right? Just to thank you. Oh wow. Have one of our challenge coins. To oh just man. Add to your little collection if you have some of those. Thank you so much. And that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah. My uh, just. A, Oh yeah, go for it. So you got out of the military, obviously. Yes. Uh, when, when did you get out? Uh, August 2014. 14. Are you going to school now? Yeah, I'm. I'm doing. I'm going to graduate school at CU Boulder, uh, mechanical engineering and engineering management, Jeez. and I graduate in May. Yeah. Good combination. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah my speaking of that, like my uh, my African linguist, it takes about two or three years to be vetted and come to the United States to get a a visa. He's uh, he's actually in Austin right now, which I'm happy to know that he's safe. Um, because a lot of the time, the Taliban, they, they do kill the linguists or their families. So it's good that they're, we're getting some of them over to the United States where they can be safe, especially because we can't do anything without them, because I can't learn Dari in a month. <laughs> well, please stick around, uh, talk some more with Brian and things, and join us. We still have some more refreshments in, in our uh, library there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the questions. Those are good questions. Appreciate it.